well, this talk is um, around adhesive capsulitis, so just a new marker for us to do on ultrasound. So several markers have been proposed in relation to adhesive capsulitis, but I'm going to focus on the auxiliary capsule assessment, as you can see from the photo on the left. So QScan conducted a study in December 2019 on all patients that presented for a shoulder ultrasound. Hence why we're able to propose a technique to the team now that we have learnt is achievable and reliable. So the technique we were reproducing and we're proposing tonight came from a study of auxiliary capsular thickness. The study was on both MRI and ultrasound. It was published 2019 by Cernic. So the auxiliary recess anatomy we can see here over the humeral head, uh, we've got the synovium which is blue and the hyaline cartilage overline. So that represents this hypoechoic where the asterisk is. And then the green represents the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Um, so between the calipers on the ultrasound image, that's what we're measuring for adhesive capsulitis. And then the joint capsule, which is yellow. So the capsule and the ligament together form a complex. Essentially, we're measuring the two together. Um, so overlying that, you sometimes catch sight of teres minor, coracobrachialis and, and pec major. So Cernic established a two millimetre cutoff um, for the upper limit of normal, finding that the patients with adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder had a thickness greater than two millimetres. And this is what we were finding as well. So the technique, as I said, we reproduced the Cernic study, but we were also combining it with another study that looked at um, whether the degree of abduction of the arm made a difference to the thickness. And conveniently, they, um, they tested between 50 degrees, 70 degrees abduction and 90. Um, and the cutoffs are sort of holding true. So even if a patient can't abduct to 90 degrees, which most adhesive capsulitis sufferers can't, and we can perform the test with about 50 degrees abduction. Apparently the ligament actually gets thicker the more you abduct anyway. So we performed our study with 50 degrees abduction and I'll show you how to do that just with a video. So the two techniques that have been proposed, you might have been familiar with the one that includes the recess. So we looked at whether that was reliable, but we also measured according to Cernic between these red lines here. This this measurement that includes the whole recess is less reliable because in its causes of glenohumeral pathology, which are many and varied, the effusions um, can cause that to be thickened and it's not necessarily specific to adhesive capsulitis. So what, what we found during our studies is the positive adhesive capsulitis patients typically couldn't produce a stop sign with their arm. This was probably more indicative of adhesive capsulitis than just looking at the degree of external rotation they could perform. The previous studies back in 2016 were of this um, capsular measurement, including the recess. So you can see by doing comparison studies in this adhesive capsulitis case, there was a difference at that location, but since then, we've found that their cutoffs, which were around three millimetres, can sometimes manifest in patients that are normal and patients that don't have adhesive capsulitis. A Park study just established a cutoff of three millimetres for the auxiliary recess. So we're proposing tonight that we don't use that for adhesive capsulitis. You can still use that view to demonstrate an effusion but the actual glenohumeral ligament and capsule is best measured over the humeral head with a cutoff of two millimetres. Other studies have proposed four millimetres for the measurement performed um, down here at the humeral head neck junction. And I guess it's similar to the hip view that we're probably familiar with for um, anterior hip effusion, um, but we've since moved on to this newer technique I'm introducing tonight. So the view was able to be achieved in all of our patients, even those with severe pain. We were finding that while we saw thickening of the ligament in the auxiliary view, they didn't always manifest the other signs of adhesive capsulitis you might be familiar with, such as coracohumeral thickening around the rotator interval. And degenerative rotator cuff tears and tendinopathy have been shown to thicken this region and cause increased vascularity 
and and yet these patients don't always have adhesive capsulitis. And the other thing we thought is that the this ligament measurement is more sensitive and reliable, more so than the posterior glenoid view that we've typically done to look for capsular sliding over the labrum. So there's a view or a dynamic assessment we perform for looking um, at bursitis and whether there's distortion of the bursa. We affectionately know that as the scarecrow to stop sign position, which looks like this. So you can see the acromion on the right, the bursa and the whole cuff have to slide underneath the acromion during this position. Most adhesive capsulitis sufferers get to about halfway and can't externally rotate fully up to the stop sign position. And those patients are the ones with the thick capsules and they don't always show signs of bursitis. Um, so that's just on the clinical assessment, we're finding that helpful. Here's how to actually perform the view. So by bringing the back of the hand to the chin, you can see we're abducting with some forward elevation, following that posterior auxiliary fold. That's a good grip to, you sort of need a power grip to get this view. You push up into the axilla and first try and identify just the humeral shaft. And so by using the shaft and sliding up higher into the um, axilla, you'll find that curved humeral head. Mostly you land on the teres major, so it's a triangular hypoechoic muscle. And the best place is not at this location, but slightly more anterior to this. You need to oppose the movement because they're naturally going to want to shrug their shoulder while you're pushing up under there. And once you've got a nice view of the humeral head, you can freeze and wind back. And we want to measure perpendicular to the beam. So get that capsule nice and um, parallel with the top of the screen. And that's reliable. So the cutoff of two millimetres under two mil should be normal, greater than two mil um, is abnormal. And that came from the Cernic study. And that's the one recent study that also compared with MRI and it's very reliable for both um, modalities. When we do the posterior glenoid assessment, which should be fairly routine in your assessments, what are we looking for? So I just thought I'd put in a normal shoulder ultrasound. So in this image, obviously the humeral heads to the left, you see a portion of the labrum as an echogenic triangle and the posterior capsule seen here slides over the labrum. So the arm begins across the patient's abdomen with the palm up and as the patient initiates external rotation, the capsule begins to slide over the labrum. So if you look here, it's like a smiley face. So it's bowing towards the humeral head, in towards the joint space is the normal appearance. So that came from a study a long time ago. Um, Niels Grobler was a radiologist I used to work with and he um, made us do this staging system. So varying degrees of adhesive capsulitis will cause the, the capsule, instead of being in a smiley face shape, it starts to bow out, sorry, rather than concave, it starts to become convex. And then you can see the ligament starts to thicken, the labrum appears less triangular and bulky due to the synovial thickening. And then you can see it's distorting right out like this. So that's what we're looking for in the posterior glenoid um, view. I'll just show you two cases. Um, so this patient is 55 male. This would be fairly close to what they call a grade one adhesive capsulitis. So you can see fairly normal x-ray, bound or normal ultrasound of the cuff. When we go to the posterior capsule of you, you can see as they externally rotate, just back at the first part of this video, you see that it's bowing away from the joint. So it's convex not concave. So it's a very subtle marker. It can be very difficult to pick, which is why this auxiliary view of the inferior glenohumeral ligament holds a lot of hope for us. So this was using the old technique where we used to measure at the humeral head neck junction, the whole recess. You can see the abnormal side, it's severely thickened. The normal side, it's a little thinner. But if we were to use the measurement over the humeral head, you can see the normal sides dramatically thinner and much thicker on this side here. So while we're sort of steering away from measuring the recess, as you can see, 
it can bow out and contain a whole lot of fluid, which could be kind of humeral OA, it could be post-traumatic effusion uh, and not specific to his capsulitis. Um, there's other ways of looking at the capsule. Of course, you could do this in an axial view, see it from front to back. So we're seeing the capsule front to back. But just in, this, in the spirit of keeping with the CERNIC study, we, we decided to do it in longitudinal. The second case, this is a 70-year-old male. Um, I just want you to observe the capsule here. You can see it's not in a smiley face shape, so it's convex, it's bowing, and also the labrum is not well defined. So when the labrum starts to look less triangular, you can bet that there's some synovial thickening happening, and that's a very subtle sign of adhesive capsulitis. This is the third case now. You can see a really nice, normal um, supraspinatus and rotator interval didn't look very exciting. And then if we move to the posterior glenoid view, a 64-year-old female, um, you can see that her labrum looks thickened, there's synovial thickening around it, and the capsule is bowing at this point here during the external rotation movement. Over here, same thing, you can see it's moving up and away from the joint. So there, there are varying degrees of effusion that can go along with adhesive capsulitis. <clears throat> so the di diagnosis is very difficult. I'm not saying that we'll be 100% accurate, but by doing the auxiliary view, we can obviously add to this assessment when we're not sure exactly what pathology we're dealing with. <clears throat> obviously, when there's severe, severe glenohumeral joint degeneration, you've lost the joint space, nearly all these patients will present with near total lack of external rotation. Um, and so <clears throat> performing the posterior glenoid view is still helpful to show the large effusion that can be associated with the um, osteoarthritis. And severe cases of degeneration, sometimes you'll notice the labrum is actually loose or everting out of the joint. So if you watch this one, the labrum actually squelches out of the joint and subluxes out. You can't see the normal triangular shape. So this can signal you know, that we need an MR or some other imaging for glenohumeral joint pathology. Now this image I just put in to show how you can measure an effusion. So if you're wanting to document it on a worksheet, you measure from the humeral head up to the capsule. And as a rough guide, five millimetres is the cutoff upper limits of normal. The other causes for why the clinical assessment can be tricky is, of course, the nerve injuries that come along with um, dislocation. So in this case, we can see a nice normal teres minor muscle there, and over here it's got this fibrous fatty replacement. So when you see this echogenic change in the muscle belly, we can suspect that there may be some denervation injury. So I call this the ski goggle view. It's uh, a longitudinal probe approach drop down from the spine of the scapula. So the spine of the scapula is here. We see the infraspinatus and then the teres on the abnormal side, infraspinatus and teres on the normal side. So obviously a normal muscle should be hypoechoic like that. So I call that the ski goggle view and many of our learning shoulder sonographers are performing this view and doing a really good job of picking up these injuries. So again, different patient, ski goggle view, normal infra, normal teres, normal infra, abnormal teres. So that ski goggle view is very helpful for trying to work out why a patient can't externally rotate because these muscles are external rotating. So just in summary, this is how we're performing the measurement. So you measure the inferior glenohumeral ligament at the level of the humeral head, ensure that you exclude the hyaline cartilage. And in preference to being on the teres minor, just try and move your camera slightly more anterior to that muscle to ensure that that's accurate. So that's now being added to worksheets so that you can document that. The take home message from me would be always compare. If you can compare with the other side and it looks different, we can signal that there may be a change here and they can do further investigations and try and get the right treatment for the patient.